Right, I think we've got a full room, so we'll get going. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rowan Conway. I am the director of the Connected Communities Research Programme here at the RSA. The research that I work with covers health and social care policy, and we have a range of projects that look at how social isolation and mental well-being works in communities. Obviously, dementia is a key issue at both a personal and a community level, and so I'm very much looking forward to our special lunchtime talk by Professor June Andrews. Just before we begin, could I just double-check your mobile phones are switched off and or gone to silent? Um, we're filming today, so there are cameras in the room, and we'll be live streaming over the web, so virtual wave and welcome to those watching online. And a reminder that our hashtag today is RSA Dementia, if you want to get involved with the discussion on Twitter. Now that these housekeeping notices are over, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Professor June Andrews more formally. Um, as many of you know, June is the Director of Dementia Services at the um, Development Centre, Dementia Services Development Centre at the University of Stirling. She's a renowned leader in the international movement to improve services for people with dementia. And she joins us today to discuss one of the UK's most pressing, pressing uh, it says here future challenges, but we're actually, we've been in discussion saying current challenges, <laughs> existing challenges. And she argues for a revolution in our approach to dealing with dementia and will give us some insight into the kind of system changes that will make a dramatic difference to delaying the onset of illness and caring for people with dementia. Um, June's new book is um, something that I will be reading with great interest, um, but I will pass over to June for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I've come here at this moment armed with a tiny watch and a pair of reading glasses, and only to discover that there's a beautiful large clock in the corner, so I probably don't need to use my specs. Thank you very much for coming to hear me today. Uh, in spite of the title of the presentation, I've had some, uh, some correspondence with people who felt that the expression, the dementia time bomb, was a really bad title for describing anything to do with dementia. One of the things we have to be aware of is that um, the language that is used around dementia is really, really important. For example, in all the discussions I've been having with people about this, uh, the person in the newspaper always talks about dementia sufferers or people suffering from dementia. And people with dementia will tell you all the time that they don't want that language used. They want to be called a person with dementia or if you're talking about them in hospital, they would be a patient with dementia or in a care home, they would be a resident with dementia. People don't want to be described as sufferers, although there is no doubt that dementia causes suffering. It causes suffering in the person who's affected by it, in their family. It causes suffering in the uh, financial affairs of any country which has an ageing population. So um, it's a bit of an issue, as we were saying. And one of the things that lots of people have been asking me is, why did I write the book? And that's actually answered to a certain extent by the way I went about writing the book. Because... Uh, I have, a, I have a lovely husband and a daughter who was about to start university and I sent them to Australia for six weeks um, because in order to write the book I needed some time. I wanted to make sure that the content of the book was it, nothing that you couldn't find. Everything in there is something that you could find on the internet. So this is not something that I know about especially because I'm a professor of dementia studies. It's all there somewhere in the ether, mm. in the information that comes from organisations like... Um, the national dementia or Alzheimer organisations of any country. But the point was it did take me six weeks and I am a professor of dementia studies. So the key thing is that people with dementia and their families don't have six weeks in the kind of experience at sorting information that I have in order to pull together this information. So I sent them away to Australia, Skyping them twice a day and I pulled together this book which is a, meant to be a one-stop guide so it covers everything from what dementia is, all the way through to how you manage finances um, and things towards the end of life. Because dementia is a fatal illness. If you don't die of the condition that is causing your dementia, um, uh, it's because you've died of something else in the meantime, uh, which is also often associated with old age. So um, in their absence, with great pleasure, 
I sat and wrote and wrote. And it was amazing how much nonsense I had to sift through in order to get the material that was necessary for the book. Um, but the first thing that was quite clear from what was written was that the people who wrote about dementia were confusing dementia and other conditions. Now, I've actually had the experience in a church hall where I talk about dementia for a while, and at the end, someone puts up their hand and says, oh, professor, we thought you might talk about Alzheimer's disease, or we thought you might talk about something else. So I realise it's very important to separate out what dementia is. Now, dementia is a cluster of symptoms. And these are symptoms which include memory loss, the thing that people are very familiar with. But my friends with dementia tell me that memory loss isn't the worst part of the dementia syndrome. Because many of us already suffer from memory loss. I'm not very good at remembering things, but I make notes and I work things out. You know, I, can't, I couldn't remember my way here today, but I worked it out. The problem for a person with dementia is that they can't work anything out. So when they forget something, they're completely stuck. And you know what it's like if you've completely forgotten something and you've got no way of working it out. It gives an incredible feeling of stress and stress makes people behave in strange ways. The sort of behaviour that people used to call disturbing or disturbed behaviour is actually stress behaviour or distress behaviour caused by the person with dementia. Um, not being able to work out what's going on, not being able to put things together. And there's a whole range of diseases that cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease is one of them. It's the most common, but also vascular disease and a range of others. I used to say there, there, there are half a dozen. I'm reliably informed there are 100. There was a competition recently where someone said, could you name more than three causes of dementia? I'm a professor in the subject. I was struggling. It's actually a whole range of diseases that can cause dementia. So when you have the public debate about dementia, it's really difficult because people say, oh, we're going to cure Alzheimer's. Now, that would be great. If Alzheimer's was cured, then more than half the people with dementia would be OK, but the other half would be completely untouched. Um, people talk about cures for dementia, and when we read the paper, it turns out all they're talking about is one of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, because Alzheimer's disease, like other causes of dementia, has a range of symptoms. And so... Um, one of the examples I often use to illustrate this is the example about how um, some of the research says that a glass of red wine a day will help delay the onset of dementia symptoms. Um, that research came from the University of Bordeaux. You can <laughs> make what you will of that. Um, I wasn't that impressed with that research because personally, I don't like red wine. But it turned out there was some amazing research from the University of Reading, and that research said that a glass of champagne can help <laughs> ward off the symptoms of dementia. And I love champagne, so I thought that was evidence that, you know, there's somebody above looking after me. But when I looked at the research, it was only Alzheimer's, and when I looked at the research, so far it had only been done on rats. But as far as I was concerned, that was good enough for me. <laughs> So it just shows, in terms of people reading the research evidence about what makes a difference in dementia, and newspapers and magazines reporting what makes a difference in dementia, in many cases, it's absolutely influenced by what the person says, what the person believes. So I believe the champagne stuff because I like champagne, but I don't bother telling people much about the red wine story. So the really important thing for people to know is, is there any evidence at all about what it is that makes a difference in dementia? Now, most of the things that uh, I talk about in my book, which will help you stay well with dementia, are things that there isn't a huge amount of research evidence for. And that's mainly because it's very, very hard to get any money for research that demonstrates the benefits of those things. When there was a, a G7 stroke 8 summit on dementia in 2012 in December here in London, um, there was a great deal of interest from the pharmaceutical companies and people from both the UK government and the American government said, we're going to find a cure for Alzheimer's. They were absolutely clear they were doing it. But the pharmaceutical companies were very interested and vast amounts of money were spent. But it's really hard for me to get money to prove one of the things that I accept as an absolute fact about dementia, which is that simply increasing the light level in the room makes more difference in many cases than the drugs do. 
So if you've got something as cheap as that and as simple as that, it would be really great if somebody would pay for me to examine that research, but that's not as sexy as inventing a drug that's going to make a difference. And I sometimes compare it with the difference between, you know, if you're thirsty, you could dig a well or you could send somebody to Mars to see if there's any water on Mars. One day it's going to be important to know whether or not there's water on Mars. And that's my equivalent of a cure for dementia or a drug for dementia. But in the meantime, can we just dig some wells and help people as they stand at the moment. Hydration can make a huge difference in dementia. My colleague Mark Butler and I recently did a report on the care in hospitals, some hospitals in Wales, and we found people in hospital who were very, very dry at that time. The situation's been resolved. But dehydration can really reduce cognitive function in people with dementia, and yet in hospital, people weren't being given enough to drink. Why would you take someone to hospital and make them worse? It really doesn't make any sense. So then you say, well, here's a woman who sounds like she's an advocate for people with dementia. You know, she's campaigning. Well, that June Andrews, she really cares about dementia. Actually, if I had a heart of stone, I would still be making the same argument. If you weren't an audience of, if you were an audience of, of finance directors of companies or, or health ministers, you would actually argue in the same direction that I'm going. Because dementia is a phenomenal economic and financial problem for all developed countries. Um, it's a, an economic problem, in particular for countries which have the fastest ageing population. So, for example, it used to be that in many parts of Africa nobody got dementia because they didn't live long enough, but now they're starting to have serious problems as the success of all their other public health measures means that the population is ageing. So it's a huge economic problem, and I remember when the Westminster government announced its dementia strategy, which had been partly created by Professor Shubhi Banerjee. I remember Shubhi saying, you know, it's, it's really not very clever because what's happened is we've now got a government that's right behind a dementia strategy just at the time when we're having a total economic crisis. The last thing you want is for people to be interested in your subject at the point when they have to explain, as the Northern Ireland health minister explained when he launched the Northern Ireland dementia strategy, explained that there's no money for the implementation of this strategy. Dementia is a big economic problem. More than cancer, heart disease and stroke put together is what it costs our economy. It's a phenomenal amount of money. And the other bit of bad news is these are the good old days when there is plenty of money. There's no indication there's going to be any more money in future. And because dementia is a condition that affects older people and ageing populations more, because I plan to be 90, and by the time I'm 90, I have a 50% chance of having dementia as a female in a developed country. So um, because there's a, an ageing population and because money is a problem, these are the good old days when there is plenty of money and these are the good old days when there aren't many older people. When you look at the way it's coming through, the way the numbers are coming through, it's our children, grandchildren, loads of them are going to live to be 100 years old in the way that many of us uh, won't. So when we've got this situation where there's a big economic problem and there's a, an ageing population, what does the government give us? Well, we get dementia friends. You, know, you can have a 30-minute lecture and you can learn a little bit about dementia and you can have a badge to wear that shows that you, you know about dementia. Um, and we get headlines in the newspaper all the time. Um, cures for dementia. Um, it's really... You know, you can imagine what it's like in my house. I'm the main wage earner in my house, and I come home at night and they've all got their heads in their hands because the newspaper says there's a cure for dementia, so mummy's going to be out of a job, you know, what we're going to do. So we've got all these headlines about cures, and we get scary headlines which tell us that things are going to cause a problem. And you would have seen the news stories that came out, NHS, um, sorry, BBC 24-hour news during the night on the World uh, Service, started off with a story about the fact that certain commonly taken medications like Nitol could cause dementia. And medications that were used for urinary tract problems, continence problems, caused dementia. And an 86-year-old man rang me up at 9 o'clock in the morning and he'd been to the clinic, to the prostate clinic the previous Saturday. He said, I'm not taking the medication because it's going to cause me to have dementia. And when you looked at the research, Actually, the research didn't say anything like that. First of all, it was an American kind of night hall with the same name, which is not available in this country. Uh, there was an association between this medication and dementia. There was no sense at all in the research that it caused it. But the BBC reported this as if there was a causal relationship. 
and anything, any responsible um, um, analysis of this research was buried really, really low down in the story. So the fear of dementia and the false hope about dementia is something that's built up in the media. Now, in response to that, one of the things we're doing at the same time as the, the launch of the book is starting a survey on what people really do think about dementia called The Big Ask. There'll be more um, available information on that on our website and other places, and it's part of something we're doing which is called the Festival of Ideas, the Dementia Festival of Ideas, because we're trying to work out what it is that can be done under these circumstances where we've got governments who are fearful about dementia but who are suggesting policies that are not necessarily going to make a huge amount of difference, where we've got professionals who in many cases are not educated about dementia except in a very superficial way. So if you as families turn to them, they're not going to be able to give you practical solutions to the problems that you've got. And then there are people here now who are meeting it this week in their family, in their street, in their neighbours. What are you going to do now? And that's the sort of thing that we've tried to put in the book. Because there's a fundamental issue about health and social care services that I think we need to face. But it's really difficult to express this in a way that makes it sound as if you're not um, attacking the NHS or attacking the government. Because one chapter in the book, chapter 12, is about how to survive a hospital admission. A hospital is like a meat grinder for people with dementia. When people go into to hospital and they already have dementia, they very rarely get back to their previous level of functioning. If you've got dementia and you fracture your hip and you go to hospital, the research shows you are less likely to be given pain medication than a person who doesn't have dementia. And why does that happen? It's because they come around and ask you if you're in pain. And if you think you're at the golf club and you wonder who's asking, you're certainly not going to say, yes, please give me some medication. The combination of pain and dementia in hospital gives rise to a condition called delirium from which people uh, get so ill that very often they die within six months, but they certainly are not easily discharged back to their own home. So there's something about the way hospitals are run that make them very dangerous for people with dementia. And so chapter 12 is about saying this is how you can help your friends and family if they happen to have dementia to survive a hospital admission. But one of the things you've got to do is you've got to go there. You've got to feed them. You've got to check their medication. You've got to make sure that they're getting plenty of water and hydration. You've got to entertain them when it's boring. You've got to stay there at night and reassure them when they wake up. And the first question people always say is, well, what about those people who've got nobody? Let the system worry about the people who've got nobody. As a family or a friend, you have to look after your own. And the reason why politicians can't say this to you is because if politicians say we've now got a health and social care system where people aren't going to do very well unless you lot come in, families and friends come in and help and support them, which is a model that's very common in non-UK countries, unless you come in and help, it's going, to, it's going to be represented in the press as if the NHS is failing. My chapter 12 was represented, I know not very many people will read the Scottish papers, but in the Scottish papers it was seen as an attack on the NHS, and it's not. It would actually help the NHS if people as citizens would actually go into hospitals and places like that and help people with dementia while they're going through a hospital admission to make sure that they are not delayed. Because from the finance director's point of view, it really helps from the person who's looking at the finance of the country. But even from the family finances, it's terribly helpful. And this is one of the last points that I'm going to make. You need to look after yourself if you want to avoid getting dementia. Now, there's no cure and there's no absolute prevention. But the stats on dementia are starting to show that we've either overestimated how many people are going to be affected or some of the public health measures that we've put in place are starting to work. So everybody in here is going to be okay and delay all their symptoms because when you come to lectures like this or when you listen to them online, that's the kind of mental stimulation, you know, use it or lose it, the kind of mental stimulation that will help you care for yourself. And there are lots of other things that you can do, general health things you can do to care for yourself. But you also, as I said, you need to care for your family. You need to make sure that the worst things that can go wrong in the system are helpful. It's terribly, terribly hard to, stay, to say this in public because it sounds like an attack on the system. When you say the nurses don't have time to do things and at the same time you want to get nurses into trouble for not having done things to your family or friends, then you're actually holding two ideas in your head that are quite opposite and that don't really help. 
One of the wonderful things about coming here today is that people will be able to ask me questions. And so I'm not going to say a great deal more at this moment, but I'm going to uh, look forward to the opportunity of you examining some of the ideas I may have uh, presented here. But if you're rich, if you're ultra rich, some of you look as if you probably are, uh, you've got no problem because you'll be able to stay in the, the care home that I think looks really brilliant, that I've seen my favourite one. It's £1,500 a week. So I booked myself into that because I really fancy that one. It looks nice. If you're really not rich at all, if you've got less than £24,000 in the bank or some sum like that, uh, you're probably going to keep okay because the state will look after you in the UK. It might not be very nice what you get, but you'll get some basic. The middle classes in between are in a really interesting uh, position because we know that in the UK, lots of people try and hide their wealth so that the council, the council, the local authority, will pay for the care. I mean, it's really unfair. If you had cancer, they look after you, but if you've got dementia, you're on your own. And uh, this book, Dementia, the One-Stop Guide, is my attempt to make sure that at least if you've got 10 quid for the book, then you're not completely on your own. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, June. Right, well, we'll go to questions in a moment. I'm going to um, so get thinking about what you'd like to ask, June. Um, I'm going to kick off with a, with a couple of questions um, to, to, to draw out some of the, the things that you talked about there. There was some really interesting, um, some really interesting stuff about scaremongering and, and bad science mm -hmm. in the media there that I'd like to tease out a little bit more because we talked earlier about how fear and fear of onset of dementia is something that is a very um, prevailing emotion. And you were very good at quelling fear, or some of the things that you talked about earlier were very good at quelling potential fear about what, what dementia is. So how would you approach reducing fear of dementia in the population? Um, and as we know, so many people are now forming that well-used term of the ageing population. So what would be your words of wisdom about uh, what dementia is? Yes. I mean, the, uh, I've not had the experience of being diagnosed with dementia, but in talking to people with dementia about what happens at that time, they say it's absolutely devastating, it's really awful when you're diagnosed because um, it is a fatal illness. So being diagnosed with a fatal illness is always a, is always a terrible uh, experience for whoever's going through that. And it means that people have got to start thinking about death and dying in a way that they, we probably don't talk about a lot in our, in our society. In addition to that, the media images that we get of dementia are you know, care home catastrophes or bad things happening in hospitals. And so you were right to be afraid and think, is something like that going to happen to me? And I think that the best way of quelling that fear is giving people the information that they need that demonstrates how they can avoid the worst of those experiences. Um, the earlier you're diagnosed, the better. Because if I was diagnosed today, uh, because I know my cognitive function is reasonably good today, I know that I've probably got 10 or 15 years during which I could, depending on what kind of dementia it is, uh, cause of dementia it is, during which I can sort things out. So, you know, at the age of 50, get yourself a power of attorney organised so that you know some of those horrible things about loss of power won't affect you because you've already set somebody in place who will make decisions for you. So having the knowledge about how you can protect yourself is a really good start. Um, I wish I could police the media, <laughs> only in this respect. I think the media should be as free as possible. I wish they would stop saying sufferer and I wish they would stop having medical cures because it always turns out to be nonsense and it completely debases the discussion. The discussion should be about the fact that in a world where people are going to get dementia for the foreseeable future, is there any light in the tunnel in terms of a cure or prevention or symptom control that is coming down. And that's not something that's helped by these, you know, headlines that, that give false information. There's one other thing which is about how dementia is um, portrayed in art. And uh, some of the movies are quite interesting. I really liked The Iron Lady. That was a very good depiction of dementia. You know, she had some spectacular hallucinations that Mrs Thatcher in the film. And uh, I thought that was quite a good way of describing the fact that 
intellectual power does give you some protection against dementia. Being bilingual gives you some protection, delays the symptoms. So a woman with an amazing brain like that still got hit by it, but she probably went on longer than the rest of us would because she had so many degrees and such a busy life inside her head. So that's very interesting. We talked also about, you talked also about public spending a lot in lots mm -hmm. of different areas. Um, and you used a well digging me metaphor there, which I thought was really interesting, mm -hmm. looking, thinking about what kind of small interventions mm -hmm. might make a, have big gains. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I think it'd be interesting to see, you know, from your research, where would you, if you had the public spending pot, what, mm -hmm. what interventions would you think would make the greatest mm -hmm. difference fastest, if you like? Well, we know from experience that um, there was a big public consultation in England about what the English dementia strategy should be. Because the UK is like a laboratory. There are four health departments with four separate dementia strategies in roughly similar health and social care systems. So you can see what the difference is in each one. <coughs> Excuse me. So in England, there was a huge amount of consultation rather than going straight to expert witness about what would make a difference. And after a lot of consultation, diagnosis was seen as being the key to dementia care because you've got voluntary organisations sitting out there having collected all the money waiting to help you, but they can't help you if you don't know that you've got dementia. Um, uh, the medication that is available is not terrific and it, not everybody can tolerate it and also it's only for one of the forms of dementia, which is Alzheimer's, but you can't even try the medication if you haven't got your diagnosis. Um, as soon as you've got your diagnosis, your nephews and nieces and brothers and uncles, everybody you've got that um, uh, round about you can start looking on the internet for the information that will help you. So diagnosis is key. So if I had the public purse, the first thing I'd do is absolutely focus on diagnosis. Um, that's interesting as well because you talked a little bit about the, the public debate and, and there again you've talked about the consultation that's gone on. Um, I'm interested to, to tease out a little bit more about if we are going to have different conversations. So you, you talked about how it's very difficult for politicians to engage with tricky questions about whose responsibility it is for care and social care. How you, you, you talked about the big ask and uh, other methods of engagement that you're using at Stirling. Can you talk a little bit more about how we can change the nature of debate about dementia in the public? Well, I think that the debate has to be taken out of the hands of the few and given to the many. I mean, to be honest, the number of people with dementia in our society is a relatively small percentage of our society. But there are a huge number of people who are affected. 800,000 people, we think, have dementia within the UK. In England, uh, about half of them have a diagnosis. And that is very low when you consider that in Belfast, for example, it's as high as 75% have their diagnosis. And so when you're deciding uh, what should be in the public domain, then what you have to do is say, who is the government talking to when they're deciding what their policies are going to be on these issues? Now, the government clearly needs to be talking to GPs because they're the gatekeepers to um, diagnosis. And yet somehow or other, the GPs in Scotland were told by the government that they had to increase the number of people diagnosed by 30% over three years, and they did that. But the GPs in England, in spite of bribes of £55 and payment for doing it anyway, they're still arguing about whether or not there's any point in making a diagnosis. Now, the research shows that when a GP decides that there's no point in making the diagnosis, it's for two very well-meaning reasons. One is because the GP thinks there's nothing that can be done and there's no services. What's the point in diagnosing if we've got nothing to give them? And the answer is, you don't have to give them anything. You know, they can find out the number of the Alzheimer's Society and go and get some help. You know, they can go and Google some help. Um, the other reason is that they feel that the health and social care system will treat them badly if they, don't, uh, if, if they know that they've got a diagnosis of dementia. That fear that you know, if you thought I had dementia, I would go down the list in terms of operations for cancer or other conditions where there might be a, a waiting time for, for care. So in deciding what the policy is, um, if you contrast Scotland and England as two parts of the UK, and you know, we, look at, we look at ways these, these things are done all over the world, it's quite clear that the focus in Scotland of saying to the guys, just diagnose. And in England saying, let's talk about it and let's have dementia communities and dementia friends has resulted in a significant number of people being disenfranchised because they don't know what it is they have got or what it is their mum has got, so they can't do anything about it. Now, I wouldn't go as far as they've got in Singapore, 
in Singapore, there is actually a law that's been there for 10 years that means that you get fined or go to jail if you don't support your parents. Um, I would like that law to be passed once my parents have passed away. That'll be all right. <laughs> uh, I, I, just get the next generation keyed up for it. No, I wouldn't go, joking apart, I wouldn't go as far as saying that a law should be made. But why did they make a law like that? It was because they knew as a government they would not have the resources to be able to manage the ageing population without a citizen contribution. Now, if we're going to reach the stage in the UK where that is the economic position, at what stage are we going to start explaining that to the public? And it might be that politicians say, oh, it's too soon to explain to the public that the NHS cannot do this kind of care for you or that social services cannot do this kind of care. So we just limp along and every now and again there's a scandal and it turns out to be the fault of the person who was there on the day as opposed to being a whole system thing. We all need to be engaged in this conversation. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Well, I'll hand it over to the floor. Do we have any questions? I've got a number of mics. So if we start with the gentleman with the newspaper, and then we'll come to you next. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned the multiple causes of, of dementia. Uh, I've been a diabetic for 65 years, and at my last consultation, I was given a dementia test, which mm -hmm. rather surprised me. But the doctor informed me that the Department of Health has asked for all diabetics to be tested for dementia. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you felt there was a common denomination for all these uh, comorbidities. Mm -hmm. And lastly, would you advise me not to live much longer? <laughs> uh, in terms of, start with the advice about living longer. However long you live, just have loads of fun, right? Start now, because you never know the moment. What is it they say? Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an important thing to do. Um, it is the case that the, um, the prevalence of dementia is greater in people who have pre-existing medical conditions that are not properly managed. One of these is diabetes. If you let your diabetes get out of control, it causes vascular damage. The famous ones that people think of are your kidneys and your eyes, but we're now aware that it affects tiny vessels in your brain as well. So it may be that they're thinking that testing you for dementia um, at your consultation is a good idea because you're, in a sense, in the risk group by having diabetes. But it's actually unmanaged diabetes that would make you at a greater risk. So the fact that you're having your consultation and your visit is good. But the other really interesting thing about that is the insult of the test. The insult of the dementia test is something, you know, if somebody asks me to repeat numbers backwards or remember an address, I would want to give them a smack. I would be really, really annoyed. And very many, very old people who know why it is they're being asked these stupid questions are terrified of failing the test get into the hands of social services, losing their home. You know, the test is not just a simple quiz, it's a terrifying portal that you may be forced through. Now, you, you know, young and fit, you think it's quite funny, but when you're a little old lady and failing this test could mean you lose your home, it's terrifying. So I think there needs to be more sensitivity around the way in which um, you know, the counselling around, the, the pre and post test counselling needs to be done around this. It's not just a simple test. Is there a particular country that uh, cares for patients with dementia better than all the others? I, I seem to remember, unless I'm mistaken, I think in Holland they have a dementia village where they have like 1950s style shops uh, making the environment fit the patient rather than the other mm -hmm. way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the idea of a dementia village with 1950s shops, I wonder whether they're changing the village every couple of years so that it keeps up with the ageing of the people with dementia. Now, I can understand the theory behind retro design in dementia-specific um, dementia buildings. If people go to our website at the Dementia Centre at dementia.stud.ac.uk, we've got a beautiful dementia-friendly virtual house on there and a dementia-friendly virtual hospital, both of them supported by charities, built by charities. And they, they give the specific design principles that will support a person with dementia. So, of course, the things I mentioned about light are in there. But because um, we employ architects who work for us at the Dementia Centre, and I know what their house is like inside, and it's not like my house. So if you were going to try to build a care home that was homely, it would either be like theirs with you know, white wooden floors, sorry, plain wooden floors and white walls. It would be like mine, which is all a bit cluttered. 
The idea of building an environment which, because it's in a particular time period, is suitable for people with dementia, I actually think is mildly insulting. What we say in our design principles is everything should at least look like what it is. And uh, so um, classic design rather than um, old-fashioned design, traditional design. So in the UK, a tap with a cross head is a classic design of tap, the thing you remember from primary school. We had a lovely um, award ceremony in Northern Ireland just day, day before yesterday where we had people with great ideas that they had implemented to make life better for people with dementia. And at one of these competitions, we had one where they'd built a beautiful new care home and the way you flush the toilet was like you do in this building, where you wave your hand in front of something on the wall and it flushes. And the old people were walking away without having flushed the toilet. So the nurse who won the competition was a guy who went to um, a hardware store and he bought a toilet flush handle and he screwed it onto the wall in front of the infrared beam. <laughs> And he put a big sign above it saying flush. And every time the old ladies and gentlemen went like that, their hand passed the beam and it flushed. Because that took people from being smelly people who couldn't tidy up after themselves when they'd been to the toilet to be people who could flush. And we can all understand the reasons why you would want a no-touch flush. But in terms of design, you have to have something really traditional. And the fact that that care home is in Holland doesn't tell you anything about the rest of the dementia care in that country. So I would have to go on a world tour to get, you know, my favourite care home is in Brighton. That's the one I want to go to. That's £1,500 a week. Can't afford it, but that's the one I would go to. There are some Australian hospitals that do dementia care really well. Um, I've recently see some, seen a, some great stuff in Hong Kong and Washington. So everywhere you go... Um, even when I was in Saudi Arabia just a few weeks ago talking to them about their work there, that, that they've got ideas that work. We had two more in the middle. Oh, we've got loads now. Um, right, lady in the front, and then we'll go to you next. Can you keep your hands up when, when the end of the last question, can you keep your hands up again so I can... I just have a question regarding <coughs> Alzheimer's Society, which I'm sure you came across it during your research. If you were Alzheimer's Society, what would be the one key message that you wanted to communicate to the public to help the situation? Mm. Well, the Alzheimer's Society has a phenomenal number of volunteers all over um, uh, England. And there are uh, Alzheimer's organisations in every country, many countries in the world. In fact, it was the Alzheimer's Society of Saudi Arabia that invited me to go and visit them just a few weeks ago. Um, if I was the head of the Alzheimer's Society, I would be doing what the Alzheimer's Society wants. Uh, and uh, they want to have uh, a fundraising uh, idea for research. So I suppose the thing I would say about the research is can we have more research into care rather than cure? Um, the Alzheimer's Society wants to gather up the energies of lots of volunteers who want to help people. So what I would say is let's make sure our volunteers know more about dementia than other people do, and not just a superficial knowledge. Um, and I would say to the Alzheimer's Society, let's have a great big fundraiser for the Dementia Services Development Centre at Stirling that Professor Andrews runs here. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you'd comment uh, on the Osher Centre in San Francisco. They're almost saying that dementia is a lifestyle choice. But what they're saying is that cognitive reserve, maintaining neuroplasticity, can postpone the symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's for 10 or 15 years. Do you, mm -hmm. do you think that's the, the direction of travel? It's mm -hmm. all about focusing on maintaining neuroplasticity rather than taking drugs? Or do you think they're mm -hmm. just out on a limb somewhere? Right. Um, the things that delay symptoms in dementia don't always... Sometimes they do make brain changes, but they don't always make brain changes in terms of the structure of the brain. And we all know that cognitive development actually does make physical changes in your brain. That's why London taxi drivers have got more grey matter in bits of their brains than, than people like me who get lost in, you know, in a supermarket. So... Um, Focusing on just one of the things that makes a difference, if that's the thing you really enjoy and will stick with, that's really, really good. It's a bit like exercise. If people really, really don't like exercise, there's no point in telling them that's the cure for dementia or the, the thing that's going to delay dementia or anything else because they're going to find it really hard to do. Um, I think to say that dementia is a lifestyle choice, um, there's, there's some attraction in that idea because 
a huge cause of dementia is, is vascular problems. And the American, sorry, the Australian dementia organisations coined the phrase, what is good for your heart is good for your head. So the Mediterranean diet, um, exercise, uh, the idea of uh, you know, taking care of conditions like diabetes or, or other conditions that might affect your vascular health. These are really, really important things. Bilingual people seem to have some protection against dementia. Avoiding stress and head injury really seems to help with dementia. You know, there have been some studies of people who've had really stressful lives and non-stressful lives and the dementia seems to come on later. Um, a lovely woman attorney who I met in Washington when I was with the American Association of Retired People a few weeks ago, she comes from a family where it's very sad. They've all got a, a working age dementia that comes on before the age of 65, all five siblings, brothers and sisters. But she pointed out that those of the, her brothers and sisters who had college education got their symptoms 10 years later than those who didn't have college education. So when you look at children, education is going to make a difference. Diet and heart physical health is going to make a difference. Uh, opportunities for exercise. There are so many things that are actually lifestyle changes that could make a difference. Um, but then in the end, there's a certain amount of it that is down to bad luck. There's some of it that's down to genetics. Some of it is down to bad luck. I mean, if you take the exercise argument, I was sitting with a really fit gentleman recently and his wife, and she said, but he's been a sportsman. You know, he's always done sport. But then it turned out he did rugby. And rugby players are really coming down with, um, with dementia now because of the constant head injury. So I would ban rugby, oh, Alzheimer's Society, that question. I'd get Alzheimer's Society to campaign against rugby in any form of boxing. Okay, um, there's a lady hiding over there and then we'll come to you and then I think we'll have time for maybe two more questions after that. Um, I'm a solicitor specialising in care and capacity issues and um, do a lot with people who've lost capacity either through dementia or other forms of illnesses. I would love it if people engaged much sooner with us to, to plan for the future. Um, but it's very much a tendency, it'll never happen to me. So I, it, I'd really like to know how we can educate and inform that people can put things in place to assist yeah. down the line. And, ah. um, what would make lives better for them and their families? Yes. One of the things I find is a really persuasive argument is when I tell people how much it costs to have a power of attorney done and I tell them how much it costs to sort out the affairs if you haven't had a power of attorney done and they almost immediately go out straight away and get a power of attorney. So the financial argument is one. And also helping them understand, because when we did a power of attorney for my mum, as soon as she signed the paper, she said, now are you going to send me on a cruise? Uh, and I said, no, I can't tell you what to do until you've completely lost your capacity to decide for yourself. But I've made a mental note, and if you ever get really confused uh, and I'm wondering what to do, I'll send you on a, on a cruise. So, you know, everybody here who doesn't have one, catch this lady at the end, and she'll probably do a discount. So again, <laughs> Alzheimer's Society, uh, fundraise so everybody can have a free power of attorney, because there are some people who are terrified by a lawyer's bill particularly low-waged people, would never think of going to a lawyer for anything. So get that power of attorney sorted. Uh, yes. Um, actually, the problem with rugby players is not the head injuries during the game, it's the excessive after-match drinking. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I think your approach is admirably practical, mm -hmm. and your um, recommendation to reframe the debate is also very useful. So with my mother-in-law, it's much better to talk about making marmalade than it is to talk about her diagnosis, which is a completely counterproductive activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder whether the practical stuff can't really work unless you address some rather philosophical questions, particularly around identity and personhood. Mm -hmm. Because what happens with dementia is that people change. They become often a different kind of person and that's associated with cognitive function mm -hmm. which then leads to a sense that you're less of a person if you've got less of a memory mm -hmm. and actually if the challenge is to retain a sense of personhood don't we need to think about theories of identity and personhood mm -hmm. and where they come from because as soon as you get into dementia and cognition 
you're on a slippery slope <coughs> to seeing people as mm -hmm. less, mm -hmm. less of a person because yeah. they can no longer remember. Yeah. The University of Leuven did some really interesting research a few years ago on the, what they called the framing of dementia. And one of the things that became quite clear from the work that they did was that the way people think about dementia is influenced by the way they think about life. So the way a Catholic thinks about dementia is different from the way an atheist thinks about dementia. People from different um, uh, ethnic communities think about dementia in different ways. And so um, in some communities, you might think that the person's less of a person because their cognition's gone. I'm sure that's why Baroness Warnock says she thinks you've got a duty to commit suicide if you get dementia, because she has lived so much by her brain that the idea of her brain not being there is is like an athlete losing their legs or something like that. You know, so it's really, really um, um, individual thing that happens and cultural. You know, so for example, in um, in some Chinese um, communities. Dementia is just seen as part of normal ageing. Now, that's really unhelpful if you want them to get their mum or granny some medication, because they've got to think of it as an illness in order to get the medication. But if you actually pull out from those communities the feeling that it's part of natural ageing and you've got nothing decent to put in its place, you say, it's not part of natural ageing, it's a disease. And by the way, there's no drug and there's no services. Thank you. Next. You know, that's really, really unhelpful. Um, so the idea of what dementia feels like if you're supporting people with dementia, you have to know what their frame of reference is. So I can say to a Catholic nun, if she says to me, oh, what if I forget God? I can say to her, God will never forget you. And that's irrespective of whether or not I believe in God or anything else. So there are examples in the book of ways in which the way the person frames dementia is really, really important. Now, philosophical issues of identity and personhood are really important. I think it's really funny when I see dementia writing where it says, you know, we should try and treat people as if they are a person. You know, the lawyer would be able to tell us, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure what the legal definition of personhood is, that the legal definitions of capacity treat people as individuals. And people worry about the fact that the person with dementia changes. Well, we all change. I am, maybe the change is more rapid than you would expect. So if, for example, the nun refused to put on her habit and go to church, do we force her to go? Because we think, oh, the way she was 20 years ago, she would have hated the idea that she wasn't going to church. But in fact, it could be that she's had a blinding flash of the obvious and she suddenly realised because some of her frontal lobe uh, um, inhibitions have gone away, she suddenly realised that it wasn't true what she believed before or not. That's the point. We can't just say there's a blanket issue. The most important thing, if there was one take-home message at all today, the most important thing is dementia is incredibly stressful. And if you stress the person with dementia, they're going to cause you more trouble and cost you more money. And you're also being cruel. So whatever it is that reduces the person's stress is an important thing to do. And um, there are some people who would think, um, uh, think that, that they're... The prospect of having dementia is too cruel. I had a, a paper which was published um, just this week, which was reflecting on the, the suicide of a female uh, psychologist who had discovered that she had Alzheimer's disease and she decided to have a bit of a party to meet all her friends and then she killed herself. And I thought of that as being like an, throwing, an, throwing a hand grenade into the bushes. She would have no idea what effect that would have on other people doing something like that. Um, if she just quietly committed suicide, that would have been okay, but making a song and dance about it is making a public declaration that I, an influential woman in the community, believe that this is how one should behave. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's the, the personhood, control of your body, control of your mind, loss of control, it's all really, really difficult. And a lot of the fear about dementia is actually fear of the bad treatment that people have and the loss of power. Mm, absolutely. Um, there was a lady in the back. So you were there first, and oh, we've got someone from Twitter. Can I come? And the gentleman there. So we'll go to Twitter first, but I think that those three. So the, if you go to the gentleman there afterwards, that'd be great. Yeah, I've got a quick question from Twitter from Julie, who asked asked you to comment on the power of music in dementia care. Well, I tell you what, the power of music in everybody's life is phenomenal. Music is absolutely, and and when you have dementia, the power of music is really, really great. Um, I really do not want to end up in a care home having people bringing in choirs, singing songs that I don't like to <laughs> me afterwards. So the power of, power of music to you know, make me feel really unwell will still be there. Um, the, 
uh, the, there are neurological conditions where a person gets to the point where they can't speak but they can still sing. And there are memory issues where the person can't remember whether or not they had their lunch but they can still remember their hymns and songs from childhood. So the, the music has the possibility of making a person feel very powerful because you know I can sing you know, when I have dementia, if I can sing all the words of Old Lang Syne, the people around about me can only do the first verse, then that will make me feel I'm in a world where I'm always stupider than everyone else. Here's something where I'm cleverer than everybody else, so it's very enhancing. We would really like to know what people think about the power of music, and so in our big ask questionnaire that we're putting out, we want to ask questions about what people think about the power of music. One of the things that people want to do is they want to help and they want to be nice, and so they trot along to the old people's home and they give them some entertainment. It's almost as if they think that you become undis undiscriminating when you're old. You should just be grateful for what you're getting. And so, you know, if, if I have dementia, what are you going to do? Are you going to take me along to the festival hall to, see, to hear some medi medieval music? Are you going to sit me in a room with some headphones and some really heavy rock? You really need to know about me before you know what it is that's going to make me feel better. So music in itself is just like food. You know, the power of food is you have to eat but, you know, if you want to really tempt me, you need to know something about me. Fabulous metaphor. Lady in the back. Okay, yeah. Um, Jane, I just wanted to know what you thought of the Admiral Nurses model and why we aren't having more of them. Okay. Um, the Admiral Nurse, for people who haven't heard of them, uh, traditionally, because I understand they're going through some changes now, the Admiral Nurse was a model where a charity um, funded nurses who would support families who were affected by dementia. Um, we did some research in, we did some work in Chelsea in, um, in somewhere in London <laughs> a number of years ago and you can tell by looking at the age profile of a population how many people probably have dementia. That's how we know for example that of the, um, the well if, I'm, th I'm trying to think of the best way of explaining this. In this particular borough of London, from the population profile, we knew there were about 1,400 people with dementia. When we looked at the GP register, because when you're diagnosed with dementia, you go in the GP register called the Quaff register, we knew there were 400 people with a diagnosis. That meant there were 1,000 missing. And we knew of the 400 people who had been diagnosed with dementia, about 40 were getting access to the Admiral Nurses Service. And so my, my diagnosis at the time was that the Admirals, what the Admiral Nurses did was great, but 40 families out of 1,400 benefiting from a service probably wasn't going to be cost effective in the long run. So it depends which aspect of the Admiral Nurses Service you're interested in. If the fundamental principle of supporting families is the fundamental principle, then that is a good idea. But you can't support a family with dementia if they don't know they've got dementia. So uh, a cadre of nurses who just went around diagnosing for me would get a vote because you don't actually need, for many cases of dementia, you don't need a very complicated diagnosis service. So they sometimes um, have said to me in, in other parts of the UK, why don't we have admiral nurses? Because they're very focused around the London area. Uh, and my answer usually is because you can't afford it. It's sharp. Okay, our last question because we do have to finish it being a lunchtime event. I know uh, many people. Thanks very much. Um, I'm a trustee of Action on Elder Abuse. Oh. And uh, two, two points really. One is I think you have a touching faith in power of attorney because our experience is that quite a bit of abuse is committed by people who have powers of attorney, particularly where the uh, subject of that power um, has not got mental capacity. Uh, but I just want to say, what do you think about the safeguarding industry? Well, I guess part of the safeguarding industry, we publicise, and you're against that, uh, because it upsets people, worries people. We publicise care homes that have got um, incidents of abuse. Uh, we, we, we lobby government so that we can have more intervention to protect people. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to run counter to the kind of philosophy that you're proposing mm -hmm. or promoting. Right. And I wonder if you've got mm -hmm. anything to say about that. So I think my first response is around your first point about power of attorney. And it's not that I have a touching faith in powers of attorney. 
have a touching faith in everybody's capacity to pick someone they trust. So if you give power of attorney to someone and it turns out you've made a dreadful mistake and you've given it to some low life that's going to rip you off as soon as you can't defend yourself, then pff, more fool you. I know that sounds trivial, but what I'm saying is you absolutely have to, if you're going to not be able to look after yourself, you have to have as much power as possible to demonstrate who it is you think you trust and to put your faith in them. And so I wouldn't ever say anything in public that would make people feel that a power of attorney was a risky thing to give to somebody. Power of attorney is for want of anything else, is the best thing you can do. So I know my daughter, I know how she is now. I give her power of attorney. If it turns out that she marries some fiend who influences her to be bad to me afterwards, then that's just part of life's rich tapestry. And the majority of people of powers of attorney are actually, I think, lawyer could comment, better protected than people who don't. If what we're thinking of is a more sophisticated way of protecting people, then um, I think that it, it becomes that safeguarding industry that you speak about. You know, who is going to be the one that makes the decision? Are we going to get social workers to do it? You know, who, who is going to make that? The advantage of the power of attorney is it's relatively inexpensive because, you know, the, the, the family member or the, the friend who's going to do it for you, unless you get a lawyer to do it for you, in which case there's some cost. In many cases, there's no cost to the person who's being looked after. Um, I absolutely applaud what you do in highlighting the abuse that older people uh, suffer from and doing everything you can to make sure that that is reduced. It's a terrible anxiety for families and for older people uh, who are vulnerable. Um, I think that the people who abuse older people should be pursued relentlessly and they should be exposed and, and, and things should be done. But I don't want it to end up being the case that everybody who is old is afraid all the time uh, and feels that they're uh, in a a terribly vulnerable situation. Again, it, become, it comes back to what we were saying about mm -hmm. dementia. You know, we try to tell people as much as possible about dementia, but we don't want to make people frightened. Because if you're frightened, it causes stress and that makes you more likely to have symptoms anyway. Mm -hmm. So the really important thing is for me to know as much as you possibly can so you can help yourself as much as you possibly can. And um, uh, information is power. And, and I'm really happy if people either online or on the film or in the audience disagree with me. I'm really happy to interact with them. We've got our big ask going on and there's lots of free text box in there where people can do the, that June Andrews, I don't agree with the word she said, this is what I think, you know, <laughs> she should do something else. And uh, it's, it's the initial part of our year-long Dementia Festival of Ideas. The, the Dementia Centre that I, uh, I work in is supported by charity, the Dementia Service Development Trust, and it's their 25th anniversary this year and they've basically shaken their purse right out to the very bottom to give us all their money for the festival of ideas and that's where we want to gather the ideas that will shape what we do in the next 25 years. Well thank you so much for joining us today. It really has been a, a, a sort of whirlwind tour of a multi-dimensional issue. I mean I think we've covered diagnostics, design, lifestyle choices, identity and public and personal finances. So it's I mean, it's, you're very versatile. <laughs> it's, it's a really, really rich issue. And um, June's book is available outside, and I'm sure she'd be delighted to sign a copy if Absolutely. you would, would like to take one or in, uh, buy one. <laughs> um, so on that note, um, thank you very much for, jo for joining us, June.